gentlemen. My name is Sydney Adams, and I am pleased to introduce to you Io Dele Drum and Dance. We are in Chicago. We are one of uh, Chicago Park District's art partner with Sherman Park, and our mission is to foster a community from a feminine perspective through the study and performance of diasporic African music and dance. Right now, I want to introduce you to one of our Jimmy Fola's, Ms. Victoria. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, say hello, everyone. Hello. Right. My name is uh, Victoria Botang. Uh, so when I was three years old, I was diagnosed with autism. I couldn't speak until I was seven years old. I had to go to special ed classes from kindergarten to fifth grade. I also had to go to speech therapy to improve my speech impairment. I was told that I would never make friends. I had never had a driver license. I was told I would never graduate high school. But coming to Aya Delhi, not only do I make friends, I have a family, I have a sisterhood, I have a whole community right behind me. So I'm gonna tell you right now, anybody with a special disability or anybody with autism, you can do anything, you put your mind to it. If you work hard, you can do anything.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can we have another round of applause for Ayodele? <laughs> and before we get started, I also want to acknowledge Free Spirit Media, who's filming for us this evening. So thank you to Free Spirit. So my name is Akila Haley. I'm one of the co-chairs for Chicago African Americans in Philanthropy, CAPE, as well as Deputy Director for Marwin. Welcome to CAPE's fifth annual Connecting Philanthropy and Community. CAPE is a membership organization committed to advancing ad investments in African American communities. We promote dialogue between philanthropic organizations and nonprofits serving people of color. We advocate for investments by African Americans, and we help build infrastructure for leadership roles in philanthropy. One other piece of housekeeping, if you're doing any social media, please tag us at CAPE, as well as 2018 CPC. So CAPE's signature event was previously coined as the Lindsay Lectures. At this time, I want to acknowledge its namesake, Handy Lindsay Jr., who announced that he will retire from his post as the president of the Mott Foundation. Among other, many other foundation leadership roles, he was also former CEO of the Field Foundation. Although he couldn't be with us this evening, I think it's appropriate that we also congratulate him. So if there are any other Black Foundation leaders who are in the room with us, can you please stand while we honor you as well? Presidents, yes. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so today also marks the 64th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, the unanimous ruling that public school segregation was unconstitutional. Yes, this was a very pivotal moment for all of us. But yes, we still have a lot of work to do. And so tonight is a glimpse into all of the amazing work that we are doing. But before I move into the program, I want to take a moment of silence to acknowledge the passing and honor the legacy of Pastor Ron Taylor, a devoted organizer and faith leader. Pastor Ron was one of the founding members of the United Congress of Community and Religious Organizations. CAPE is grateful to have been able to recognize him last year as he was one of our honored champions of social justice. Thank you. At this time, I want to direct you to the inside cover of your program to highlight a few updates of CAPE. On behalf of the CAPE leadership team, we want to thank Claudette G. Baker for her countless contributions as CAPE's longstanding director and Kay Zahira Sultan for her dedication as interim director. And we welcome Angela Rudolph as CAPE's new director. Now this is a surprise to them, so while Claudette and Zahira walk up to receive a token of our appreciation, we would also like everyone to save the date for our upcoming membership meeting, which will be on Wednesday, July 25th at Cliff Dwellers. Thank you to Graham Grady and the Lloyd A. Fry Foundation for hosting the event. Claudette and Zahira, we have a little token for you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Now for the program. It is my pleasure to introduce our event chair extraordinaire, Tawa Mitchell. 
Tawa. <laughs> Tawa is the program officer for MacArthur Foundation's Chicago Commitment. A native Chicagoan, Tawa is dedicated to community service, particularly in healthcare, education, and youth programs. She served as Director of Education Policy and Partnerships in the Office of Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Inaugural Interim Directive, Director for Thrive Chicago, Executive Director for Strategic Partnerships at the City Colleges of Chicago, and Assistant to Mayor Richard M. Daley for Education. Yes, she's worked with both mayors. <laughs> <laughs> Tawa has also worked in varying capacities with Chicago Public Schools. She serves on the Board of Directors for Chicago Women in Philanthropy, the Augustana Henze Endowment Fund, and the Iona Calhoun School of Ballet. She is also a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and Lynx Incorporated. Welcome to the stage, Tawa Mitchell. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Akila said, my name is Tawa Mitchell, and it gives me great pleasure to stand before you as the 2018 CAPE Chicago African Americans in Philanthropy, Connecting Philanthropy and Community Event Chair. I am so incredibly grateful that you chose to be here with us this afternoon. We recognize the demands on your time and we are simply thrilled that you made the decision to join us to celebrate the accomplishments of these extraordinary honorees and to participate in what promises to be a thought provoking and fascinating conversation with our panelists. Chicago has such a rich history of artists as problem solvers from Charles White and Margaret Burroughs to Amanda Williams and Chance the Rapper. <laughs> Many Chicago artists have leveraged art as a mechanism for social change and community building. We are so excited to celebrate Chicago's rich connection to the arts tonight or this afternoon and explore the ongoing connections between arts, activism, and social justice within the African American community and certainly beyond. I should be clear, however, that CAPE's connection to the arts began long before today, and each year we are quite deliberate about integrating the arts into our formal program, as we did with Ayadeli Drum and Dance to this afternoon. Weren't they wonderful? Yes. <laughs> um, I encourage you to review your program for a list of the performance artists we have highlighted in the past. Each year, we also recognize an outstanding local artist and select an original piece of art for the Champion of Diversity awardee. We are fortunate to have them with us tonight. And when I call your name, please stand. Um, our first awardee was Juarez Hawkins, who's also a panelist today in 2014. Thank you. Stephen Flemister, who was our awardee in 2015, our noted artist. I didn't see Dio Leoye come in, um, but he was our 2016 um, artist uh, for that year. Okay, I just wanna make sure. Um, 2017, David Anthony Geary. <laughs> and this year, 2018, Mr. Raymond Brody. Thank you for joining me and giving them another round of applause. They are truly, truly phenomenal. I hope you saw their extraordinary work in the slideshow in that first monitor as you were settling in today. And if not, you have a chance to see it again <laughs> um, at the conclusion of our program because that slideshow will run throughout our, throughout our reception, which I hope you stay for. Um, we will have drinks and appetizers and lots of fun and more networking, so please stick around for that. Um, but we encourage you to take the time to really marvel 
marvel at their work. Um, information about each artist as well as how to purchase their work um, can be found um, in your program. And it is just so critical that we support our own African American artists. So I encourage you to take a look at the slideshow and really um, in your program as well. That said, I would also like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the Connecting Philanthropy and Community Event Planning Committee. Um, we, um, I just, would you stand if you're on the committee and you're actually in this room and not working right now? Um, would you please stand and just acknowledge them, please? Thank you so much. Their names are also listed at the back of your program, and please hug each one of them, especially the women outside as well. Um, you can see that they've truly been extraordinary, and as the saying goes, it does take a village, so I really, really am appreciative to each and every one of them. Many thanks also to our generous sponsors and supporters. You see their names behind me on the screen and in your program. Their generosity not only makes today possible, but it actually um, supports our programs for Chicago African Americans and philanthropy throughout the year. So we are so grateful to them. Of course, I want to give a special shout out to my colleagues and friends at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, um, many of whom are here tonight. Um, they're just amazing, amazing friends and supporters, not just of my personal and professional endeavors, but especially for their unwavering and undaunting support of Chicago African Americans and philanthropy. So thank you for that. I love y'all. Um, <laughs> and last but certainly not least, please join me in thanking our presenting sponsor, J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, I especially, please, please, please give them a round of applause. <laughs> I especially have to thank Whitney Smith for her friendship and support. She was the first to answer the call and go all in for this event. Um, and so for that, again, we're extraordinarily, extraordinarily grateful. Um, I also want to thank Marsha Coleman. You guys don't know her, but she is like the most detail-oriented person. And she has dotted every I and crossed every T to ensure that we can have this event tonight. So we're really grateful for her efforts as well. And at this time... It gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Damian Heron. Um, Damian is the vice president of the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation um, Office of Nonprofit Engagement, and he's just a rock star, and uh, please give him a warm welcome as he joins the podium. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm just happy that Tawa came in between me and that performance just now, because I was not prepared to follow that. So thank you, Tawa. Um, when Tawa reached out to us to uh, sponsor, she said she wanted space for us to sponsor, and then she wanted perfect weather. Yes. And so we made some calls, and I think we delivered in all three. So you're, you're welcome. Um, so. Many of you know uh, last year we announced a $40 million uh, three-year commitment to the city of Chicago. Um, so a quick update on that work. Uh, you know, at the end of last year, we hit the cross the $10 million mark. And this year so far, we're uh, still having conversations, still working actively to get dollars out the door and looking for ways to partner with many of you foundations in this room. So. Um, just stay tuned. We are looking to make some more announcements this summer uh, around some additional investments. So uh, more to come on that. Um, so instead of talking about our work, I figured I'd do something a little bit fun. Um, so compliments of uh, my colleague, uh, Jason Maltina, who is one of the main curators of our art collection at the firm. Um, we have uh, two prizes over here, which are two books that um, details all of our, the, the uh, artwork of the firm um, and um, makes a very nice uh, centerpiece uh, uh, table um, book. But uh, I'll provide a few uh, uh, stats on our art collection, um, which many people don't know about. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, first of all, we have one of the oldest and uh, largest art collections um, of any corporations uh, on the planet. And it uh, was started by David Rockefeller in 1959. And um, I will give these two books to the people who can get closest to the number of um, pieces of art that we have in the collection. So um, who, just go ahead and throw some numbers out. Um, 
Not bad. 560? Okay, I think go higher. 10,000? 30,000? 50,000. 7,000. That's very specific. You must know somebody. 1.3 million. 1,700. 75,000. 2,000. So we have, so I think the closest I've heard so far are 30,000, so that the correct number is 32,000 pieces of art <laughs> that's in our art collection, which is pretty impressive. And I think I heard 50,000 somewhere. I, I, I'm gonna say that's probably, was there, was there something? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. So, um, so you two get these uh, two pieces of art, so congratulations on that. Um, so just to be hand delivered. So, uh, so um, these, th this artwork is installed in 450 offices across the world. And we make it a point to purchase art from living artists. So no starving artists as, as far as Chase is concerned. And we hold on to this art so it's not, you know, we're not selling. So um, we really do make it a point to support arts through uh, collecting, educating, uh, community partnerships, exhibition, and our corporate sponsorships. Um, and uh, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't um, say um, a big thank you and a shout out to our team, Whitney Smith, Charlie Corrigan, Eric um, Schroeder, uh, and um, Owen Washburn, uh, for all the work that they're doing on the philanthropic side, and of course my colleague uh, Nicole Elam on the government relations side. So thank you all for being here. Uh, we appreciate um, you joining us this evening and enjoy the program. Thank you. Hand delivered, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alicia Tate and I'm chair of, Cha of CAPES, not Chase's, CAPES Social Justice Committee, and it's really an honor to be here tonight because I get to do something really wonderful, which is talk about my colleague and friend, Heather Parrish. <laughs> um, maybe we'll, well, I'll probably cry, so I'm just warning you now. But <laughs> anyway, um, but Heather, I was trying to remember when I met you, Heather, and probably, which is also true for a lot of people here, I, I couldn't remember. I, it just feels like I've known you forever. And I'm sure it was some kind of very important conversation about increasing the capacity of the organization where I was working or advancing my leadership or connecting me to the community in a broader way. I know there were some concrete things, but what I, I don't remember any of those from our first meetings, but what I remember is that I left that meeting knowing that Heather was not only my colleague and my ally, that she was my friend. And I think that's how most of us feel um, when we've had the privilege of having contact with Heather. But that doesn't mean she doesn't work hard. Um, you know, the champion of diversity award is to recognize a model of leadership and action by professional in philanthropy that particularly focus on, focuses on improving outcomes for black people. And Heather really exemplifies this because Heather puts in work. I don't know a better way to say it. I was looking at her client list. It's like her list of all her clients and projects over her career. Girl, it was over 150, okay. right? While she has a full-time job. so. I mean, it's just the breadth and extent of the work that you do and have done with such a wide range of organizations and individuals, and government officials, and all kinds of entities. Um, and her nominator, Marion Philbin, um, says that she really credits Heather with ensuring that racial equity has, is addressed in every aspect of grant seeking and grant making at the Pierce Foundation. So that's, that's you. She's also played a really significant role recently in being the lead consultant in the Truth, Race, Healing, and Transformation in Initiative that's being spearheaded by Woods Fund. And as Angelique Power at Field Foundation says, Heather's incredible, fierce organizing prowess and depth of soul brought THRT to new places we could not have imagined. So let me just close by saying a little bit about Heather's soul. Um, you know, I have witnessed, and I'm sure we all have, the generosity of her, 
her spirit in terms of sharing her time and talent and treasure with us in so many different ways from advice and counsel to um, being a shoulder when you need a shoulder to giving me rides home when I'm tired at the end of the day. I mean, Heather's just has done that for so many of us. And even when we've been in situations, there's been times when I've been in meetings or situations where I've messed up and Heather has called me on it and said, no, you need to do better. And I've seen her do this with other people too, but she always does it from such a place of caring and respect. And so while Heather totally demonstrates a love of black people, Heather Parrish just loves people. And she models for us, I think, as black people, the importance of leading, leading boldly, leading gracefully, leading consistently, leading over time. But really what she models is that particularly now, in the kind of time we're in today, that we have to lead with love. So thank you, Heather, for leading us with love. Please join me congratulating Heather. Thank you, thank you, oh my goodness. Thank you, Alicia, for that gracious introduction that was like over the top. <sighs> I am truly humbled and overwhelmed by this recognition from my Cape family. Those of you close to me know that I'm not a person that naturally gravitates to the limelight. Um, I prefer to work behind the scenes as a servant leader to support others in furthering their work. So needless to say, I'm a little out of my comfort zone tonight but I ask that you please bear with me as I read my remarks. So I want to start by giving praise and thanks to the creator and divine energy of this universe that sustains me and to which I pray for guidance each and every day to fulfill my higher purpose. I'm also delighted to be sharing this evening with my fellow honoree, Erica Allen of Urban Growers Collective and this year's Cape Champion of Social Justice. She's awesome. I'm so glad she's here with me. Last week, I was at a neighborhood funders group conference called the Community Change Learning Exchange that brought foundations from around the country here to learn about the racial equity efforts of Woods Fund Chicago and the Field Foundation. And one of the speakers was Michael McAfee, who was the president of PolicyLink. And one of the things he challenged us all to think about was whether we felt our current work fully reflected our life's vocation. And in reflecting on this, I have to say absolutely yes for me. I am definitely living my life vocation, what I've always referred to as my calling, a call to help black and marginalized communities thrive on every level, a call to use whatever means that I have to help others who need a way in, to gain access to resources, opportunities, and experiences they may not be able to otherwise a calling to do life's work that results in greater diversity, inclusion, and equity throughout the fabric of our society. Okay, so at this point in my speech, um, my original speech, I had like five beautiful paragraphs written about how my calling was shaped by my upbringing in California, in the Bay Area, and the, the light bulb moment for me that revealed my calling in community economic development and how it has manifested in my life's work, but it's all on the floor the cutting room floor in my office at home because I was told I had limited time to be up here, so. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm probably already at my limit just about. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention how I am striving to achieve my calling through my work in philanthropy, particularly as it relates to the wealth gap. And I know about this personally because it affects me and my family to this day. The recent report from the UIC Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy states that nationally, the black-white wealth gap is one to 20, and that one-third of black and Latinx households in Chicago have zero or negative net worth as compared to 15% of white households. And as we know, the ability to transfer wealth or not has generational impact for decades. This wealth gap is playing out with our nonprofits and their ability to galvanize resources at critical times, 
and this reality, coupled with being located in neighborhoods that are unofficially redlined, makes their ability to respond to crises so much more difficult. This is why the focus on racial equity, not just diversity and inclusion, but racial equity, is so critical. This is why we who hold the positions we do in philanthropy have to do what we can to leverage our relationships and social capital to close this gap. So if I can make an introduction or referral to a colleague that can open a door for someone, or make small but unrestricted discretionary grants, or advocate for an organization to be considered for multi-year funding, or customized capacity building support, I will to the best of my ability. But I am also clear that despite all of our best intentions, our philanthropy will continue to serve as charity band-aids until structural racism is dismantled. Right. <laughs> Having said this, I am truly grateful to have had the opportunity to be involved with the Webolt Foundation, Woods Fund Chicago, and the Crossroads Fund as all of the groups they support are engaged in critical organizing and advocacy work that we all benefit from. Special, special heartfelt thanks to my Pierce Foundation family, particularly Dennis and Martha Pierce, Martha is here tonight, for trusting me to help them shape and further their philanthropy, as well as the foundation staff, Marianne, David, Laura, and Chris, thank you for your support. You are a great team to work with. And of course, I wanna thank our grantees for all of the great work that they do to provide housing, and supportive services for our society's most vulnerable, those experiencing homelessness. I would like to conclude by thanking all of the angels and ancestors in my life that have helped me along the way. My family, particularly my mom and my dad, they couldn't be here, but I really wanna say how much I appreciate them for all they have done and continue to do to support me on my life's journey. I wanna thank my boyfriend, Gerard, for his love and support and being here with me tonight. This is a rare sighting, folks, so if you haven't met him, <laughs> meet him. And you may not see him again. Um, <laughs> I also want to give a shout out to my cousins here in Chicago, as well as my church family. Sincere and heartfelt thanks to all of my sister friends, my mother friends, brother friends, and father friends who have been mentors, advisors, coaches, colleagues, and served as extended family for me in my times of need. And sincere and heartfelt thanks to all of my friends and colleagues who made it time to be here. Um, because I know there's like numerous competing events happening tonight, and I have a special connection or shared experience with each of you, and I hope to have an opportunity to thank you in person tonight before you leave. I truly represent a kaleidoscope of encounters and experiences that have created the woman that I am today. So finally, this is my last paragraph, I promise. <laughs> when I learned that CAPE wanted to give me this award, I was in shock for at least two weeks, and I still have moments of disbelief. Um, I really don't think that what I do is all that extraordinary. Um, but clearly you and many others out there see me in a very special way that I just never imagined. Um, you just never know who was watching and how your actions and words can impact others. I wanna close by echoing the words of Sharon Bush when she accepted this award last year. It is truly the highest compliment and honor to be recognized by one's colleagues. And I'm very humbled and grateful for this recognition. I can't thank CAPE enough for choosing me as this year's champion of diversity and philanthropy. Thank you. So we want to invite Mr. Raymond Brody up to the podium. Um, as you heard earlier, he has created this original um, lovely piece of art, um, and that is each year's uh, diversity champion is an original piece of art. So if you want to say a couple words about the piece and then take a picture. Hello, I'm Raymond Brody, and uh, I had a speech prepared, and someone told me that I only had two minutes, but I say, no, 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 I'm only going to take one minute, because it has to be something that I remember and something that I really, really feel is part of what I'm going to say. So it is indeed an honor and a privilege to have been selected as the artist to present one of my paintings to Heather Parrish, 
the 2018 recipient of the, and I, I, I hear you saying CAP, and I wanted to say C-A-A-I-P since I didn't know what it was. <laughs> okay. So uh, the, the title of the painting is Three Generations, and if you look at it, you can see that the painting is of three generations. And the message of the painting exemplifies the principles of both the MacArthur Foundation and the CAAIP organization. In keeping with these principles, we are all committed to pass down our knowledge to future generations and keep alive the fact that youth are indeed our future. So we need to remember that the youth are our future, and we have to pass on the knowledge that we have to the coming generations. Now, I will say one other thing. I had some difficulty when uh, Tower called me and says she wanted me to pick a painting. I said, no, 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 no. You come and pick a painting. <laughs> and so Heather, not Heather, but Tower was sick and couldn't come and pick a painting. And time was running out. So I say, I'll just have to pick a painting. So I had picked a painting, and then Tawa came and said, no, no, that's not the painting. <laughs> I had even prepared a speech for the painting. And she says, no, 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 that's not the painting. And so fortunately, the painting that she did pick, I was able to come up with a, a message about the painting. Fortunately, because I have messages for all of my paintings, I think that it's incumbent upon the artist to paint a message, to give a message. This art is my platform to reach out to the community. So my paintings are the only voice that I have to get my message out to the community. So all of my paintings have a, ma a message. So I want to close in presenting this painting to Heather and I have one more thing that I'd like to say to Heather. I really wanted Heather to come and select a painting. <laughs> but we did it backwards. The organization picked a painting, then I had to come up with a message. And so I read up on Heather, read up on the organization. And I think that this painting tells the story. So but thanks again for letting me come and present this, OK? Thank you. And just a really quick word, since this is turning into somewhat of an informal program, which, hey, that's great. Um, so in my own defense, and in defense of Chicago African Americans in philanthropy, or CAPE, um, the way it works is um, we have the CAPE community submit names of local artists. So each, each awardee is actually nominated by the field. Anybody in Chicago can nominate one of our awardees, either our diversity champion or a social justice champion. And so we have that open nomination for a few weeks, and then somebody writes a personal statement and submits a CV or resume of their nominee. Our committee meets, and they are selected from amongst their peers. So to be clear, this isn't like Tawa picked the awardees or something like that. I just happen to love 
Heather, which is like amazing. And I've served on this committee for three years and um, it's a joy every time to read about so many black leaders in our city who are doing amazing things with their platform, which is the field of philanthropy. So I wanna say that. Um, with regard to the artist, they're selected in a similar way, um, except it's more of a closed process. So CAPE members, our committee in particular, um, submits nominations of artists that have moved them. And then after we read, um, read and rank the, the scores of our awardees, we do the exact same thing with our artists. So we have a room at MacArthur, and we put all the art on the screen to the extent that it's publicly available, and we discuss their art, and then we select an artist. So while that, um, that too is a process, and of course, CAPE purchases the art from the artist that's selected. So I wish I could say that I handpicked everybody, but the committee actually does do um, its own due diligence. And so it's not only um, an honor, I think, for our awardees, but it's also an, art, an honor for our artists um, to, to lift them up in this way. So again, I encourage you to look at that. And so with that said, Cheryl. Hey, how are you? Oh, good evening. I can actually say good evening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Erica Allen. I thought I knew who Erica Allen was. Um, I thought we had met before, um, but we hadn't. It was a surprise. Many of you know her, but I didn't meet her until I got a chance to do some development work consulting f for her. Um, so it has been an honor getting to know her. Erica spent the last 15 years working on food justice issues. From operating seven urban farms on 15 acres of land predominantly located on Chicago's south side, to training and employing over 300 youth annually and now 30 formerly incarcerated adults uh, or returning citizens through programs such as Fresh Moves, Mobile Market, Farmers for Chicago, Summer Youth Corps, and most recently the Ready Program in partnership with Heartland Alliance, to helping vulnerable populations help themselves by learning how to provide for their own needs in an environmentally sustain sustainable manner to her annual two-day workshop entitled Dismantling Racism in the, food just, in the Food System. Through all these things, Erica's commitment to social justice is evident. It could be said that Erica's passion for food security and the urban farming movement is in her genes. Her father, Will Allen, founder of Growing Power in 1992, is considered by many to be a trailblazer in urban agriculture. With her father recently retiring, Erica is now blazing a trail of her own. By marrying her education and advanced degree in the arts with her love of and expertise in urban agriculture to create a new nonprofit organization called Urban Growers Collective. Under her co-leadership, Urban Growers Collective's vision is as follows. Through activism and growing food, we give the tools to foster individual growth and opportunities for freedom. So with no further ado, please join me in welcoming CAPE's champion of social justice, Ms. Erica Allen. I'm double mic'd, so I don't, I'm not sure why but it might be a little stereo. So thank you all so much for, um, for this award, and thank you, Cheryl, for the very surprise nomination. <clears throat> for me, this has been a very challenging couple years. Um, we've, we've really gone through, um, first with Growing Power and now with Urban Growers Collective, a whole kind of renaissance transitioning. Um, it's hard, I think, for founders to retire and, um, and it's been and it's challenging as well as sort of the heir apparent to kind of move the ship forward, um, but it's also been um, incredibly re rewarding. I love Chicago. I love black people. <laughs> I, love, I love social change. I love the magic of transformation. It's something that um, has captivated me and kept me in the city since 1987. Um, I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago at a time when, 
you know, um, the idea of talking about structural racism openly was not something that, that we did. Um, something that, <clears throat> even as artists, um, Dred Scott was really um, courageous in, in his piece, um, What is the Proper Way to Display the American Flag? And, you know, that kind of, that legacy of challenging the status quo, of challenging each other um, in this city and beyond this city is something that is, is, a, is a passion of mine and it's a responsibility. So I grow food, you know, it's part of my ancestral legacy. We've always farmed, whether enslaved or prior to enslavement. Um, there's the power of being able to have access to land, to put seeds in the ground, to nurture that soil from the, the seed to the plant, to the fruit, to the decay, to that regenerative process. That's magic. That's something that, um, that sustains life, that is life. And that's, that's part of our legacy. And we've been divorced from that legacy because of slavery, because of um, structural racism, all these things that um, we're beginning to talk more about, not only within our own community, but with the broader community and this multicultural city. But it's something through agriculture that, um, that we have to do. And for me, having um, the privilege over the last you know, decade and a half, two decades, to work with young people, to get them to start from the beginning of a program talking about slave work to being so proud of being able to grow food and take that home to their families. Like that is the healing circle. That is the activism that I do. <clears throat> the activism of being able to have a farm in the middle of Grant Park that's farmed by our kids and to do it in a, in a way that is so beautiful that it, it elevates the idea of what I think a lot of us think of as farming and agriculture is something that we had to get away from, to elevate from, to be able to move forward. So that's my work, um, to make that beautiful, to, to make that a centerpiece for healing, that we reclaim our environments, that we're able to sort of, um, not just sort of, heal from the trauma of um, our ancestral legacy, our ancestral memories, because it's still there. Um, it's still manifesting in our, our communities. I do that through food. I do that through activism around policy so that we own land, that we all own it, whether it's publicly held or privately held, and that we can build wealth. But we can't do that if we're still in pain, if we're still struggling, if we haven't taken the time to rebuild our relationships. So I, I've been uniquely privileged to have been educated in this city, um, to be an art therapist, to be able to bring that even when I'm just you know, picking tomatoes or selling at a market, I try to try to represent and exude that energy so that we're able to slowly chip away at these things that have been holding us back. <clears throat> I'm also very privileged to work with a multicultural group of folks who have all taken on the task of um, addressing white privilege and white supremacy. It's incredibly important. Um, and for I think for all of you who work in foundations and you know, work with folks who are entering philanthropy, like that is so important. It's so important if, to support this work, whether it's the kind of work that I do or many of my colleagues and peers over the long term. We cannot heal this stuff in a year, in a three year cycle. We can't do it. It takes 10 years, 10 years. You know, so that's sort of my, I've been at this so long, I can't like escape from it. <laughs> I want so badly to go in my studio and like make art. <laughs> I can't tell you. I'm not, you know, I just, I can't, I, I, I can't. I'm starting to more as I'm getting older, because I'm getting older. But it's, it is, that is the calling. It's like I have this, this skill set. It's something that is rare. And I, I have to use it to, to transform this environment. And I'm committed to Chicago. I, I can't get out of the city. So, um, so with that said, I could, you know, three to five minutes is, is this a little rough, y'all? <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> so, um, but thank you so much, and I hope you all visit. Please visit our farms. Um, come do goat yoga, which sounds crazy. I'm not so into it, but I love the goats from afar. <laughs> Mo most importantly, please come and, and just eat some of our food. We grow the soil, and we grow that food, and it's it really, there's a big difference in it. And, um, and I want to see these kinds of farms, these healing spaces, these nourishing spaces in all of our communities, but most importantly, the communities that, 
you know, that we just hear all this negative stuff about. You know, those, th those are the communities that, that need us and why I do this work. So um, with that, I'm just gonna read this little piece of our core mission. Rooted in growing food, we cultivate nourishing environments which support health, economic development, healing, and creativity through urban agriculture. So that's urban agriculture. <laughs> it's not just, you know, having um, some vegetables growing in a lot. It's really about this full transformation and healing within our city. Thank you. Another round of applause for Erica Allen. Congratulations. So um, while we were preparing to frame today's conversation um, about that we're about to have right now, um, each of the panelists was adamant that they did not want like their long bios read um, with lengthy uh, recitations of their credentials. So um, I encourage you to read their short bios, which are in the program, and also Google them, because they're really awesome, awesome people. Um, and I promise you will be impressed. <laughs> um, so that said, we're going to get right to it. And when I I call your name, please come forward and take your seat. First coming to the stage area is Tracy Hall. Tracy is the director of the culture program at the Joyce Foundation, and she's also a poet in her own right. So Tracy will be moderating our discussion today. Next we have Miss Amanda Williams. Um, Amanda is a visual artist and a trained architect and a visiting critic at Cornell University. Um, Amanda is headed to Italy for an awesome upcoming exhibition. So I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled uh, that we were, we snagged her just in time. And Juarez Hawkins um, is a sculptor and adjunct professor at Chicago State University. Um, Juarez, as you heard earlier, was also our very first um, CAPE artist for the CPC event. And I Lisa Jaco um, is a dancer and choreographer, and she is also the co-founder and executive director of Mural, which is magnifying urban realities and affecting lives. Um, last but not least, we have Dean Onye Asusu. Um, she's the dean of Columbia College School of Fine and Performing Arts, and she's also a dancer and choreographer. Um, so we welcome all of them mightily. Um, <laughs> And I have one, some of you brought illustrative slides, which are also here. So if you feel the need to, um, to uh, do that, just uh, press this green button. Um, if you want to share your slides to underscore your points. Thank you so much. Okay. I don't know. I can't see that. So we may need some prompts for that. So we'll figure out how to do that. Um, yes, absolutely. Well. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm inspired yeah. to be in this room uh, and also to be amongst family. I think one of the reasons why it uh, worries that line between formal and informal is because there is so much love and respect in this room, yes. right? And we can be ourselves with each other, absolutely. It's hard to be in this room without hugs and kisses and admiration. Um, I'm thinking about one of the winners of the um, one of the awardees, one of the artists who was awarded, Stephen Flemister, actually cut my hair <laughs> <laughs> with his daughter in his hand. <laughs> so we are in community, right? We are absolutely in community. And I absolutely want to say, and I really can't start um, talking to the illustrative um, 
the um, in terms of their practice artists on uh, the panel without also um, really calling out um, the presence of Susan Taylor of um, of Essence here and if you can just stand. such an extraordinary culture keeper. And um, I know I'm not the only one who cut my teeth um, on essence and feeling like, especially in light of this panel, and feeling like uh, black women and black women's cultural production, intellectual production, political production was being centered. And I think Essence remains, after all of these years, one of the only vehicles in print that does that. And so I just want to thank you. I want to thank you also for being here and bearing witness. And I also want to thank, and I, and I have to, I also want to thank Mr. Brody, because you gave such an extraordinary jump off point for this conversation. <laughs> I was thinking, did you read my notes? <laughs> when you said that your art was your platform and your art was your vehicle for getting the message out to the community. And I think we have um, four artists who do that and who do that so well. And um, what's important for me, and I was thinking about this, and it's even in terms of how you're sitting, you have two artists who do that with their visual language, and you also have um, two artists who do that with dance vocabularies. And so I really want to do deeper dives um, into that because so much is encoded in both, obviously, mark making and also movement. Uh, and they're both catchments for important cultural preservation. So I want to talk about that, but I want to first think about, uh, Joyce, we've been thinking a lot in the last year or so about three different areas when we think about the Midwest. And Erica, I can't get out of Chicago either. <laughs> I'm still here for two years, 16 years later. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to talk about uh, you know something that's specific to not only the Great Lakes but definitely to Chicago um, is uh, this uh, idea that I want to sort of like uh, think a, a little bit about um, with you is that we are in a space where um, art and activism have been wed from the beginning. I can't think of any artist um, in Chicago. Um, whose work has been of note um, that hasn't um, brought those two things together, art and activism. And so as we've been thinking about when it comes to it, Joyce, when we think about economic mobility, next generation stewardship, and racial equity, I was trying to look for um, those um, sort of inflection points in your work, and each of you are doing that work. Each of you are mentoring. Each of you are out there in community. Each of you are curating other artists and providing platforms. Each of you represent economies of the individual, where your work is generative, where you're hiring other artists and bring, incubating other artists and their practices. And I think, um, so that's next generation stewardship. And I think each of you are um, talking about racial equity in your work and your everyday, um, your everydayness. And so I just wanted kind of to get into that and I wanted to ask each of you um, maybe to talk about your art as your platform what it is you are doing what it is you're thinking about right now and um, what you hope we can learn from that I'll start with you Amanda. yes start with Amanda I'm looking right in at Amanda I'm like yeah 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 you're gonna be in a warm seat in a warm seat um, so I'll actually I'll start with where my head is at right now which is actually in Italy um, um, I, as Tracy said, or somebody said, I was actually trained as an architect, so Mr. Brody, thank you for being my shoulders that I get to stand on. Um, there are only 400 black women who've been licensed in architecture ever um, in the field. So when I was starting, there were 150. So we've made leaps and bounds, but we've not really gone far enough. And so when I was invited along with Andres Hernandez, who's my collaborator, to be a part of the Venice Architectural Biennale, which is the premier platform for the whole world. Now Chicago's on that stage. Um, we were asked to mount um, an installation that had to do with citizenship in the United States, particularly from the lens of African Americans. So that's not a small request in this day and age, or any day and age, but this day and age in particular. Um, and so we've taken the step to say that black woman space matters. So that's making me very nervous, but also making me very excited that um, 
in this in this world stage, in this platform in which architecture is talked about in a sort of routine way, that not only have we foregrounded African Americans, but black women and space and movement. And so although I'm not a dancer or I'm not trained in a way that um, thinks about using the body as a way to, to do that communicating, shaping space is something that very much thinks about the body. And so of late, that's been foregrounded for me. So your words sort of resonate um, in my mind, the work seemed very foreign to anything I had been doing before, and everybody um, recently has known me for painting these abandoned houses in Inglewood, um, and it seems divorced from those things, but it is about this platform and about using this moment, um, which I joke with Andres and say, we're never getting invited again anyway, <laughs> so why not just put it out there on the table? <laughs> so. Um, that's literally what we've done. We made this beautiful sculpture that has very much to do with the body, but also black women's spatial practices to really think about how we sit as these awkward things in the room, both in the profession and in, in public space in general. And so we've made this beautiful structure that I'm not allowed to show you or tell you about yet until three days from now. But um, just know that it's very much about making sure that conversation is central and should be central. Um, and as you said, also um, lifting as we climb. So we've invited Shawnee Crow, who's also a Chicagoan. Yes. Um, and so part of the structure that we've made is uh, braided paracord, and she's the fastest braider ever, if you all don't know her. She recently uh, did the halo for Solange, and she did uh, Solange's headpiece for Saturday Night Live. If you don't know her work, Google her as well. Um, but she's my very magical everything. And so to be able in this moment where I have for the first time been able to acknowledge people that look like me in this profession that doesn't usually seem to care about what I look like, um, to bring someone else along right. who's, who's going to levitate uh, and continue to do that, but to also push and really think about the ways in which um, not only space and visual art, but the body also um, can be part of that conversation. So that's where my head is at literally right this minute. So that's why I tossed that out. I don't know if you meant other things, but that's... No, that's, that's a uh, great start. <laughs> and where I'm awake at night and Tala has to tolerate the panicked text messages, like that's where I am right now. So, and a great shaper of space and maker as well. I'll pass the torch. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. Um, I'm currently resting creatively. Oh, I'm yes. hoping very much to get back into my studio very, very soon. Part of the reason that my own creative practice sort of took a hiatus is because I've spent the past three years doing more extensive curatorial work. Um, my last pet project has been an exhibition that just closed at the Hyde Park Arts Center. It was entitled Bill Walker, Urban Griot. Yes. And it focused on the work of William Walker, who was not only a muralist here in Chicago, he's known for the Wall of Respect and his work with that, but also a fairly extensive history of creating public art right here in Chicago. Also a body of artwork that very directly addressed a lot of urban issues. So even though the work that we had in our collection was basically, say, about 30, 35 years old, we were finding that many of the issues that were showing up in the work are issues that are still happening. Okay. And so the work was very topical, um, very prescient. And so I was fortunate enough to get the support to not only put the exhibition on, but I'm also interested in issues of scholarship. The teacher in me always wants to make sure that when I send my students out to go research someone, that there's actually something there. So this idea that there's a dearth of scholarship now is recently being remedied about the black arts movement, black art in general. And I felt that that was something that needed to be remedied. We needed to have a little bit more scholarship about this man and his work. It started as just a really nice afternoon of peach cobbler and pecan pie. <laughs> and I invited people to help me because I didn't know him personally. And I wanted to honor the work and give it the energy it deserved. It blew up into this major thing of film screenings and jazz concerts and performances and scholarly panels. And I had essays to write and catalogs to oversee. And it, it got bigger than I could have even possibly imagined. Um, one of the more gratifying parts of the project is that DePaul University partnered with us, their Center for Urban Education, partnered with us to develop curriculum. 
And so we train probably at least, I uh, lose count because I've done so many training programs. Uh, I would say easily several dozen teachers in the Inglewood area. We taught them, we, sh we brought them to the show, we encouraged them to develop curriculum, we provided a certain amount of Common Core compliant curriculum, you That's teachers right. know about that, <laughs> and basically, encourage them to not only enjoy the show, pull out their own creativity, but to bring their students in. And you haven't really lived until you've seen a group of third creators like cheer about Bill Walker, someone whose name just had not been getting the due attention it, it deserved. So that was probably the best part of it for me because any teacher knows, any teacher that's dealing in our communities know our children need all the support, all the love, all the healing they can get. So many of our young people felt really gratified by seeing the work that was there. That was a concern for me because there's so much violence being depicted. Mm -hmm. But yet at the same time, it's an opportunity for them who are seeing this sort of stuff as part of their daily reality to learn how to have a voice, to learn how to rise above it, and to use their own inner creativity to start imagining a better world, mm -hmm. thinking through what goodness can actually look like. So that was really probably my favorite part of the project. I'm currently right now, because again, I don't sleep much, um, we're working on a project with the Park District called The Art of Flocking. And um, we've, um, it's going to be a larger project. It's going to go over probably the bulk of the summer. And it's stationed in several different parks. We're focusing on the work of Hector Duarte, who's a local artist here in Chicago, muralist, activist, just really dynamic rock star of a man. And also the work of Sapphire and Crystals, which is one of Chicago's longest running, probably only oldest standing collectors of African American art by women here in the city. And so we've been going through interviews now. We're developing curriculum. So this organization, which has run pretty much informally for about 30 years, we're currally on display at the Southside Community Arts Center, shameless plug. <laughs> OK. But we're going to take the, all those lessons, all of our traditions that we have upheld as a collective, and we're now going to spread this out to all of Chicago's children in the park system. So it's very exciting and very unnerving, and somewhere in between, I'm going to get into my own studio soon, just so just watch. I'll pass this on. Awesome, I'll grab it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So my practice as of late has de dealt a lot with Sankofa, the Ghanaian tradition of looking back to move forward. And movement began for me outside of my mom's womb in my father's karate school. And I think there's a picture of us. Um, his school was positioned right next to the Stony Arts Bank. It was a building mm -hmm. there. And across the hall from there was an uh, African dance studio where Muntu, Elio, Najwa Dance Corps, all of the greats in Chicago rehearsed there. So I had the best of two worlds. I had karate, and then I had the studio where I sat there as a baby watching and eventually going to perform and dance with those companies. So one of his. Uh, pledges for us um, growing up was to make our communities better than we found them. My movement vocabulary became my platform and encouraged me and pushed me. And a project that I'm working on now is actually in honor of my grandmother and my mother. Mm -hmm. And it chronicles their voyage. It's called the Shy Sippy Mixtape. And what it is is a dance piece that chronicles their voyage from the Mississippi Delta as sharecroppers during the second and third waves of the Great Migration to Chicago. So I'm going back to that space to reclaim our presence there. They came to the North Lawndale area and creating a piece coupled with the history of people like Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf who also reigned in that area. And then that's layered with Fannie Lou Hamer and her work. And then Fred Hampton Jr., mm. who when um, he was murdered here in Chicago and they walked out of Farragut High School um, under the leadership of Dr. Baba Hannibal Afrique, who was a teacher there, my mom couldn't leave because to my grandmother, the Panthers were gangsters. So that whole piece of retelling the, my narrative um, personally and using that through a grant from the Chicago Dance Makers Forum is something that I'm really looking forward to that will allow me to echo my voice, which has been encapsulated in the inner city communities, working with young people. I run four After School Matters dance programs across mm -hmm. the city. So I finally get to step out 
as a choreographer, as an alumni of Gallery 37 and After School Matters to then go back again Sankofa as a student to now offer that and then to honor my family along the way has been very much wrapped into my practice. So I'm honored to be able to do that. Amazing. Beautiful. Thank you. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. I am um, first want to just say that I feel really moved to be in the room and to feel and hear so much reflection of black women um, and men that are working in the context of arts and particularly um, um, speaking and have been speaking and standing in the legacy of speaking about structural racism in the context of the work that we do. Um, I. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a type of work that often when you're in positions of leadership puts you in rooms where you're speaking mostly to white males. And so it's, it was really emotional for me to hear so many voices in this space and feel like I'm one of a community because um, it often feels for me like you're one battling many. Um, I, I cruised into Chicago about seven years ago, um, answering a call that comes um, as I'm learning more and more every day um, is a generational call for um, continued work on this agenda. Um, the dance program at Columbia College Chicago was starting to recognize that there was something in the structure of its curriculum that was inherently racist. Mm. And in the way that they were sorting students based on the way they were evaluating their capacities coming in was sorting them directly on race lines. They would come into the room of students that were being judged as remedial, and those students were all students of color. And they would go into the room of students that had been evaluated on a, in, in a neutral way as students ready for level one, and all the white students would be aligned because they were using ballet technique and the idea that ballet was the root of all dance as the measure to evaluate preparedness. And I came into the city and I said, really? This is Chicago. <laughs> like, right. like, this is the Emerald City. Like, this is, this is the place of footworking and house and disco yes. and you can go yes. back into uh, R&B and blues and, and Muntu. Y'all, yeah. do y'all know that Muntu is here? <laughs> um, and, and that you have, um, students that are coming to you who are, the reason that they're choosing to, to invest in higher education is dance is because they are bad and their community has told them that they are. And, and we are telling them that they have to start over, that they have to put on some tights and line up to the ballet bar and start as if it's ground zero and not build on the legacy of techniques and vocabularies that are in their body mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that reach back hundreds of thousands of years yes. to agricultural Mm -hmm. movements mm -hmm. and to an archi architecture of agriculture of movements that are in the blueprint of these 700 year old dances that you saw Ayodele perform. Mm -hmm. And so it was also really incredible for me to be in the room and see Ayodele perform. One of our part-time faculty members who came to teach at Columbia College Chicago, Ayo Alston, who was from the Muntu family and who has started her own company, focusing on women, focusing on women who drum and dance, and who represents deep study in the traditions, and who was able to get a position at Columbia College Chicago because we changed our curriculum and brought West African dance into an equal footing with ballet as the root of the American dancing body on an wow. equal footing. Yeah. <laughs> We made, a, we made a structural change in the required curriculum for graduation for every student that you take equal number of credits in West African dance and equal mm. number of credits in ballet. So one of, yes. 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 And, and that that means, um, it means jobs in dance companies, but it also means the development of an awareness of what, of the relationship between um, those movement vocabularies and an international diaspora orientation towards art that's connected to ways of life and that's connected to agricultural work, that's connected to community, that's connected to ancestry in a way that you can trace not only through aesthetics but through neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So the, the project that I'm working on right now, that I've been working on for about a year and with um, support of the, the Joyce Foundation will be um, taking um, on into the next year is called Project Tool. Project Tool is a, 
a project that was in some ways stimulated by my moving from the dance department, called in to do that work across the arts as the dean of the fine and performing arts. And as I started dealing more and more with budgets and looking <laughs> at the way that art is Art practice is, is, is positioned relative to budgets as being like, y'all are so expensive, right? Like, y'all in the arts, y'all are so expensive. And I, there was something in me as a dancer that wanted to address that question physically. And so I brought together a group of dancers, and we got some um, mentors and started endeavoring to learn how to build our own dance floors by hand mm. out of wood. And so we spent a year learning how to build modular, portable sprung wood dance floors mm. um, that we just installed yesterday down at Sweetwater Foundation where Emmanuel right. Pratt right. has put up a barn. <laughs> And they will be the sprung wood performance space in the context of that barn, which is all modular. Yeah. And, um, and we studied the intersection between learning how to use tool and understanding your body as a tool and, and, and the practice of learning how to use a tool, a handheld drill, that my uncle let me know on a Facebook post. My grandfather had one exactly like that. And feeling the power of that African idea that if I move my body and the patterns of my ancestors, I stimulate myself, my, myself into a place of being that resonates energetically, rhythmically with who I am as a multiple, that I'm more than just a body in this particular moment in time, and that my power can be exponentially increased by connecting vibrationally to an ancestral Mm. Lineage. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah. <laughs> before we go any further, can the congregation say amen? amen. <laughs> and since we have invoked them continuously, can we just um, bring someone who's no longer with us in the physical who has inspired us can you just bring their name into the place mm. so on the count of three one two three betty hall all right absolutely and so we're going to do some uh, housekeeping uh, so i'm not going to have all the fun by asking questions i have one more that i'm going to ask and then i'm going to tee you up in that question to ask a question of your own and i think we're going to try to take two or three questions from the floor and then I am going to wrap up with a question, and that way we can all be together. We can all be together in the round and be together in the circle. Um, wow. <laughs> so there's so much to say. One thing that I will just say that is not a question that I'm interested in and that each of you sort of provoke that interest, just drive it deeper, is I'm really interested, as you know, many people know, um, in microeconomics. And I'm really interested in the generative nature of the arts, the ways in which artists and art practices inspire a certain type of border crossing. But we already know that we do that in terms of thinking about, you know, these kind of like faux uh, divisions of race and ethnicity. But we also do that in terms of thinking about um, income. We do that in thinking about education, et cetera. So I'm really interested in that. I know there's been a lot of studies that say for art events, um, before someone even pays for entrance, if there's an entrance fee, they're already paying about $25 to just be in the space, that they are going to buy something, they're going to see something, they're going to eat something, they're going to do something after. There's transport. So there's already all of this, this um, income that's generated that doesn't even get to the artist yet, right? But that's inspired by the artist. But I'm also interested in how much and how many times the dollar turns over when it's in the artist's hands because none of you have talked about projects in which is just you, right? And um, I know when I think about um, Mural, when I think about um, Move Me Soul, I think about how deep you roll. Move Me Soul rolls so deep. You have so many people. And then you also have stylists. And there's all these things that are happening here. And so I just want to acknowledge that. Because when I think about philanthropy, one of the things, and especially Tao was starting us off um, in such an important way, is to think about um, where we are in our economic status at this particular moment. When we know, in 
especially I think black women, the last time we were thinking about wealth is that black women were dying negative $5,000, negative $5,000 net worth, right? Negative, I didn't say 5,000, I said negative. $5,000. So I'm thinking about that. And then, of course, I think about Dr. King when he says, you know, philanthropy is commendable, but the philanthropist must never ignore the conditions that make philanthropy necessary in the first place. Right? So we are only doing Band-Aid work, right? We have to address the structural work. And so I really want to get to that. We spent the first question really talking about your um, aesthetic practices and also how they're moving into addressing systems, right? And doing systems change. And now I just want to talk about that systems level. Um, I want to talk about your work and how you are consciously, because each of you are engaged in undoing. And I'm just going to have you fill that out. I mean, you have um, a tremendous platform, um, Amanda, that is so well deserved. I'm in representing this country at the Venice Biennale, right? That's not lost on me. Mm -hmm. And that you make time to be here. And I could just keep going down the line. But I really want you to talk about, in your own words, your conscious effort to undo and to call out that thing and to tell us how we can help you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that you, the Joyce Foundation and you in particular were instrumental in us being able to just, as Shani says, put our whole foot in it. <laughs> um, so in terms of help, I think I've been extremely, I call it spoiled, ever since. stop saying that, but I've been extremely spoiled to, to be met at every turn with uh, institutions or individuals who are willing to go with me when they have no idea what I'm talking about, and I'm sure people can echo that. Uh, but for me, it's always important not only to use the art to call attention to the disparities and inequities, but also at the same time, especially with the young people, to lay the system out for them because they are so brilliant and they are so smart and there's this assumption that we need to just teach them the art or teach them about themselves through the art. But making plain the economics of all of this has to be at a level where then they start trying to think about how they can infuse that. It's not only the art making, I'm um, thinking in particular of a piece that I had um, Anton uh, Seals was joking with me. We were talking about the vacant parcels on the south side and about Chicago Common Brick, which is a very valuable building material because it's not built anymore and it was based after the fire. So the, the heat level is superior and so it's used all over the world as a uh, building material. And so I gold leafed them and we made this pallet of bricks that was, that was symbolic of the bricks that are being mined from these vacant parcels when these houses or these structures are torn down. And then they're palleted and sent off uh, the stackers are getting $10, $12 a pallet, and the pallets are going for $250, $500 a pallet. Mm -hmm. So Anton says, you know, it's a gold mine. And then he says, but is the gold mine? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so I love those moments because they're so, mm -hmm. they just instantly beg for a piece of a thing that then can be used as the conversation point, right? So then that was exhibited at the MCA, and you know, hundreds of thousands of people saw that piece, mm -hmm. And the kids were the ones that, like, they got it right away, right? And it's like, well, how, how much is my house worth? Hmm. Hmm. I am valued, right? So instantly, these connections. And so the, the way for me, in terms of the system, not only just in my own practice and trying to constantly think about it and, and make people understand that artists are some of the most talented business people on the planet, mm -hmm. but also the systemic inequities can come through the work in direct connection, not even symbolic or metaphoric. And so, especially with the kids, I think that's super important to constantly just do stuff that allows them to talk about um, value and worth in relation to themselves and their creativity, but also why they're where they are and that it's not an accident. And to be able to see in real time that you can make art that can share that or express that. It's not just always about telling your own story, but about understanding why you have that story to begin with mm -hmm. and why you can change that story and not have to be you know, an adult to do that. Um, so for me, that's, that's kind of foregrounded. I haven't made sense of all of it yet because it's been happening so rapidly, but just to really use every opportunity to, 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 to get that message out in addition to the work itself. Mm -hmm. um, but that the systems themselves are an issue and that you can, you can make art, that's great, but you can also go be the Fed chair or you can dismantle the whole system. Like you get to pick, right? So that level of agency has to be present 
with the core curricular <laughs> learning standards <laughs> so that we can get into the schools or the summer programs or whatever, right? But all of that has to be forefronted all the time. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like your cue, Juarez. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're back in, let's go. Okay, so since we're back into the classroom, <laughs> um, my angle is one about teaching our students. Um, for those who don't know, I teach at Chicago State University. Yes, we are still here. Yay! We are still here. Okay. <laughs> I still work there. And um, part of our mission has been sort of redefining some of our courses so that our artists are actually prepared mm -hmm. to get out into the real world. It's one thing to teach someone how to paint. It's another thing to teach them how to survive as a painter. Because for me to sort of, you've invested four years in art school and then have to go work for Starbucks, I don't know. You know, so we're very interested in this idea of teaching them about residencies, teaching them about ways to network, teaching them about that human capital, even the idea of possibly starting your own business as an artist. Mm -hmm. Because this is not a climate where an artist could come out of school necessarily and go get a job in advertising as an illustrator or something like that. Right. More often than not, most of us who are artists have to hustle in some way. I mean, I'm an artist with a job, but I still have to hustle. Mm -hmm. And so teaching them the art of the hustle and in some regards, the art of the multi-hustle, meaning these multiple income streams. Right. Like you might have to teach and you got your artwork on the side and you might, you know, have to do some graphic design work. But understanding that those things do not necessarily have to take away from your fundamental practice because you have to eat. The reality of life is that every single artist has to pay ComEd every month. We have to pay people's gas. We got to pay that car note and so on. So there's a sort of academic notion that art is somehow sinful if we ask for money for right. it. But it basically comes down to understanding what we are worth and what our creative potential is worth. And there's nothing wrong with asking for funding for that. So trying to develop our students into becoming more complete artists is really kind of part of what we've been charged with in our time there, as well as teaching them sort of the fundamentals of how do you put on your own show? How do you do that? It's not just, oh, okay, I got some artwork. I'm discovered now. It's all good. <laughs> you know, from time to time, as you're on the come up, you may have to hang your own work. You may not have preparators and so on. And even teaching that some of these fundamental skills, like being able to count so you can count your money and pay yes. your taxes and things and not get cheated over. And even basic writing skills, which are often downplayed because people feel like, well, I'm an artist. I don't have to know all that. Even just in the process of creating the essays for this catalog, I kept bringing it before my students, like, right. if you write well, you can make money. You can get paid writing essays and things like that. But you have to really see yourself as more than just an image maker. You're really kind of a cultural producer, and that has a much broader scope than what we're doing in our studios. And some of that can be profitable as well. So we have to learn how to make that money. Kind of goes back to those Kwanzaa principles, like cooperative economics, mm -hmm. self-determination, mm -hmm. right. which goes back to part of what's how Sapphire and Crystals raises their money. I know I'm jumping between two projects, but I multitask. Mm -hmm. But part of how we've always raised our money is by auctioning off small pieces, one, to draw a collectors in at a reasonable price, but also to know that we always are going to have a steady pool of money. So we've operated these 30 years without any grant funding, mm. because we've just basically have been doing it for ourselves all this time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. It's important for me to build capacity as well. Mm -hmm. um, part of it's Sankofa again, like just making sure that they understand who Curtis Mayfield is mm -hmm. and his contribution to Chicago and we have a piece in our repertoire that we do it's like our revelations for Alvin Ailey mm -hmm. um, you know or comparable but we teach them how to put on concerts um, we do study abroad work in Jamaica at the Edna Manley College for the visual and performing arts thank you Tracy <laughs> doing a little blessing for us but they help plan those when we're going to fundraise for passports, they're there to understand that so that if I should pack up, which I'm in Chicago too for life, I think, um, they will be able to carry on that work in those communities in the hood. They know how to market. So it's about building them to be the administrators as well as the performers in a model like After School Matters. Once they graduate, 
they're no longer eligible to get pay, so we hire them as instructors mm -hmm. or find other funding sources to keep them in the process. We hire them as company members, as rehearsal directors, to build that legacy of the arts, not only in Chicago, but primarily on the west side of Chicago where there is not a resident dance company. We are becoming that, mm. and it's being able to be sustained by giving them a platform to be administrators and producers. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 24 years ago when I started really um, contemplating um, giving myself over to dance as a, as a practitioner, um, in my community. Um, I was also um, giving myself over to motherhood and um, mm -hmm. giving birth to my first child. And at that moment, um, I didn't really see a script in front of me that um, painted the picture of, uh, of a, a, a young, um, just out of their, you know, just into their 20s mother um, um, embarking on the type of dream that I was embarking on. Um, there, I wasn't getting a lot of reflection that that was going to be okay. Um, but I was blessed enough to have spent some of my childhood in Nigeria. My father's from, Ni uh, from Nigeria. And, um, and so I just chose to conjure up those market women instead mm -hmm. and conjure up that woman who had her baby sleeping in a basket at her feet while she haggled the price of rice mm -hmm. and um, got together da the dowry money to pay for a second wife for her family structure so she could build her business. And I just chose to conjure up those images. I chose to activate my ability to tie a baby on my back that I had learned when I was seven years old and go on that residency and take that gig and show up with my baby and say, what? Right. <laughs> I, I, I got it. I'm OK. I can handle this. I have models for this. I understand what I'm doing. Um, and let people catch up as I move through. And so when I showed up um, at my first um, tenure track position at the University of Colorado Boulder, pregnant with my second child at the beginning of a process, again, with no reflection of how this was going to work. Um, I realized, I, I fell into having to talk about structural racism because I had to clear the path in front of my own research. Um, and in the process of doing that, um, realized that this is really key to creating the network out of a, of a transformed curriculum. It's one thing to make a structural change in the curriculum, and it's another thing to build um, pathways out of that into productive activity in the economy. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, at Columbia College Chicago, we are the first institution nationwide that has, um, we just finished this past week, um, training for 100% of our faculty and staff in the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond's training in undoing racism. Yes. We're the first um, in, um, institution of higher learning that has integrated that for our entire faculty and staff. And for me, that is important because Columbia College, at its very in inception, decided to um, have a generous enrollment policy that um, from the mouths of the, of the founder's um, granddaughter was to include people of color and women um, in the arts industries in Chicago. And I say very commendable. I'm not sure that we knew completely what it took right, to address the yeah. communities that these, that these students were coming from and to give skills and a consciousness of how those skills could be applied. But I think that we're starting now to get deeper in. And, and to answer this question, like, what kind of help do we need? I really think that an institution like Columbia College Chicago needs to get um, on some levels, like, taken in and taken, can I say, over um, on some, on, at a philanthropic level by the African American community. Because yeah. we have been educating black and brown artists for, since our inception. Um, and people that don't necessarily that come from families that don't have the luxury to follow that like conservatory path of arts, but have the heart. Um, and so, so, so that's one aspect of things in terms of my work as a dean in the context of higher ed. Um, and then the other vision and dream that is starting to manifest this past year, I was co-curator of, of an event in Lagos, Nigeria called the Lagos Dance Gathering, which was like dance, but all you know, sort of interdisciplinary arts surrounding it. And, and, in the, and I, when I, I was there when Wakanda hit. Oh. And, and the thing that I think is important for us to remember in the context of an economic conversation is that as wonderful and beautiful as, as the landing of Wakanda and the message that reverberates out internationally in terms of look at that market, right? Let us remember that Wakanda wa is a Disney movie. Mm -hmm. And let us remember what Disney made its money on. Uh -huh. 
mm -hmm. and, and the images that Mickey Mouse comes from. Mm -hmm. And so the promise of Wakanda is deep, but I would hope that my students would understand that maybe you're, you're, you're coming out of a department that has valued West African dance and ballet e equally. And, and there have been those in the Chicago dance community that have said, well, you know, that department over there, like, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. They're not doing enough ballet. Their, their dancers aren't going to be able to audition into anybody's company. And I said, you are part of an international network. Did you see Wakanda? <laughs> right? <laughs> You're part of an international network. And Aisha and I have been talking about this. There are organization, organizations that are working with youth in cities like Chicago, like Lagos, like New Orleans, like San Francisco, like, 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 like in Cuba, where youth are coming to, the, to their 16, 17, 18-year-old period, period, and they've been working in these organizations, and they have skills, and they know how to mentor, and they have ideas. And there is a potential for us to flip the script on the slave roots and make a network of young creative that is international, that leverages the potential mm -hmm. of that generation of creatives to meet one another, mm -hmm. to collaborate with one another, to build networks, to get married, mm -hmm. right? And to, and to be in a space where they, are, where they are supported and funded to think about questions of the next generations. We can create innovation hubs of Afro-diasporic artists and creative on an international level that connect them to their capacity so that the next time a Wakanda hits, it's being produced by an international media conglomerate that's owned by African diaspora people. Mm. Mm. Wow. So uh, what we're going to do to economize the time is that we are going to take two questions and, and then I'm going to ask two of you, since there's four, to answer one question and the other two to answer the other. And that way we can sort of um, get the questions in and, and then we will close and we'll be able to carry on these uh, conversations, I think, in our networking too, because this to me is just a start. Um, this to me is just a start. So I've teed you up, I hope. Are there any questions? I'm going to look on this side and over. OK, absolutely. I'm put my glasses on here. All right? So please, and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Janae Moreno. Um, my question really focuses on something that I'm very passionate about is housing and cooperatives. Mm -hmm. And um, I was instrumental in working years, years ago with the artist co-op in Humble Park, Logan Square, which I will tell you failed, right? Because artists are not necessarily coming out of their schooling to find artwork. But I think we um, are not talking about how they're housed and where they're housed. The Olympics, or if somebody is in the Olympics, I have nothing against sports, I don't know it well. <laughs> but what I do know is that there is that net, right? Um, my daughter works for Monsanto, don't say nothing. <laughs> but they, they support kids and their families who are Olympians or potential Olympians. I, w I would love to see that in the arts. Yes. Right? Because as young blacks, my daughter is an artist, they do not have the ability to not work at Starbucks and say, I am going to focus. At times, I have to take my daughter and say, no, 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 girlfriend, you got to go to work today. But she's in a space where she needs to create. And going to work is not mm. physically possible. Right? And as a parent, I had to learn to understand that. So I say housing to say they need the luxury, for lack of a better word, of the ability to not go wait tables today because this is the day that it is coming through them. And do you have a question in there? To, My question yeah. is how do we get to that housing piece, to okay. that support piece? Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, and also thank you for the context. So, so I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, 
and the you said this amazing platform that I have, right? So I I credit my architectural training in large part to to being able to bridge that creativity. But you're exactly right. You know, my husband is an athlete, and so you know we have this argument, not we have this debate all the time. <laughs> um, and he finally gets it. He's like, so. You can't just go make something on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. You know, he's like, is this today? You're cranky. Did you paint today? You know, like, <laughs> he gets it, right? And so really what you're talking about, though, that housing is that incubation mm -hmm. and requires a societal elevation of different practices of value or Tracy called it once uh, culture work versus cultural work, right? Mm -hmm. Or like really getting the larger... Uh, the larger ecosystem that controls the money, not just from a philanthropic standpoint, but that we value investment bankers, not teachers or artists, all right? But, you know, somebody says that they love the art, but they hate the artists, mm -hmm. right? So um, we need more of the artists who can do that kind of conversation, and I happen to be one of them, to be blazing the trails in those, those rooms, right? And so I've lately been trying to figure out who else amongst my art family can do that and is willing to do it's like come on no come with me we got to go we got to go in these other circles so that we can elevate that conversation and start to be part of legislation policy mm -hmm. right like the infrastructure of this so i don't have quite the answer but it's it is forefronted because not lost on me how privileged i've been to be at this point where i'm not joking right like every turn an idea has been met with support and so that's highly unusual and that can't be singular. I can't be special, right? So I have to use that ability to then make it systemic. And the systemic is the elevation of the value of your daughter being still all day is not lazy. Mm -hmm. It's the next great thing that's going to cure cancer or solve Monsanto issues. Or I don't know what, right? But it's going <laughs> to it's going to do something, right? And so we have to get people in positions of power, you know, to to understand that either willingly or unwillingly, we got to be the ones to kind of bridge that gap. And that somebody said in the beginning, artist is problem solver, right? So, but we've got to take that mantle. We love the starving artist story. We mm. love talking about how we struggle, but we don't love talking about how we have a higher responsibility once we are not struggling, right? Um, yeah. So and I just want to throw that out. Your, your, First, your, the context that you set, and then the question is so prescient. So I'm hoping that if there's continued conversation around that either tonight or later, that you will be there because you know so much about yes. why it felt as yes. well. Um, who else wants to take that question? The other half. You know what? You're going to have the next question. So let's, <laughs> we're going to get right here, and then we're going to go right to you. So you're going to have your opportunity in just a moment, if that's OK. Let me just get the, and then you will be the next person. Absolutely. I'll, I'll chew yeah. on that a little bit. Just piggybacking on what Amanda said, we need to get back. We, there needs to be a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. um, Billie Holiday said, wrote something that was kind of interesting. She said in Europe, if a kid was interested in playing trumpet, the, kid, you know, the parents would sacrifice everything to get a trumpet in that kid's mouth. And there needs to be sort of a paradigm shift in the way we're thinking about art at the very, very fundamental levels from pre-K on up. The fact that the arts are being taken out of the schools is a travesty and should not be allowed to happen. Yes. You know, you cannot prioritize reading over art because they're all connected. We teach culture, we teach history, we teach motor skills through the arts. If you want your kid to be able to write and type, stick a paintbrush in their hand, stick some crayons in their hand. Yet, we're always being told that that does not contribute to their reading scores or this sort of mathematically generated measure of children's progress. And that needs to shift and come back. We need to value culture. We need to value cultural making at the earliest levels, whether our children are going to grow up to be professional artists or not. We need to understand that left and right brains exist in our heads for a reason, and both sides have to be developed, and that those things support one another. My child that can measure dye to tie-dye her fabric will be able to do measurement when she's getting into higher mathematics. Mm -hmm. So to value one above the other is really crazy and I think that it's going to lead us to generations of cultureless people who don't understand the value of art let alone the value of supporting art institutions and supporting artists. Mm, I mean yes. some of it's coming from us. I'm up here among some very dynamic women who are in here doing it but ask yourself when's the last time you bought any art? 
-hmm. When's the last time we've supported a dance performance? I mean, we have a artist dance too, right? Like, yes. yes. <laughs> By Art and Artist Eat. You know, Dance Center of Columbia. You know, number of real fabulous programs that are going on right here in the community that are affordable. Many art exhibitions are free. Are we going out and seeing this stuff, or do we need a cocktail every time we need to look at art? So we need to mm -hmm. kind of shift the way we're looking at art, the value of it in our societies. If we were the first people, then certainly we were the first artists. Mm -hmm. And we need to kind of bring it back up and elevate it to what it needs to be. Thank you so much. And so I think we have, um, Mr. Brody, thank you for um, waiting and we're ready to receive your question or comment. I wanted to answer something to one of the questions. Uh, and we, we talked about, we mentioned starving artists, and I want to say that I had a choice to do architecture or art, and I knew I didn't want to be a starving artist, so I picked architecture. architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to get back to the question, when I had my architectural practice, and I had 30 young people come in and work, the first day that I met a person in my architectural office. I said, I want you to learn something today that you can go out, if you leave my practice, you can go out and earn a living. I want the first week that you work for me, when you leave here, I want you to go out and make some money. That's number one. When you go home tonight, I want you to take to your mommy and show, look what I learned, look what I can do so that the next day you can go out and make some money. So that was always my goal, that if I spent 10 minutes with a young person, when you leave me, I want you to go out and have a way to make some money, because that's what life is about. That's what we have to do. Like someone says, we have to pay the bills. We have to do all of these things. So the first thing that I want to teach you is how to go out tomorrow and make some money. So I think that that's what we all ought to be about. How do I earn some money? How am I going to make money as an artist? And, and I can't wait around and wait for someone to buy one of my paintings or to be discovered by someone. I have to go out on my own and make some products and say, I'm not only an artist, I can do fabric art. I'm not only an artist, I can make scarves. I'm going to find a way <laughs> to make some money. You know what? I'm yes. not going to sit around and yes. wait for people to come. I've always had to find a way to make some money. So that's my answer to the question. Mr. Brody, yes. show us how it's done. Yes. <laughs> show us. <laughs> we, I know, are... Um, <laughs> so uh, figure out how you can take your art and make some money. Don't go okay. and a buy painting it. and say, come and look at my painting. This is one of my paintings. <laughs> I love it. Look, so right. There are lots of ways to make money. And it's not just by selling paintings. You mm -hmm. can sell, do fabric art, but get out there and figure out a way to. Don't be a starving artist. That's right. No, sir. <laughs> So in the interest of time, we are going to take, first of all, that is how it's done. Absolutely. And I, I, I love that scarf. So I'm going to have to talk to you about that scarf. That's beautiful. We have one more. This is your scarf. Oh. Oh. So thank you. Um, we are going to take one more question for our, our last two panelists. How do you keep track of your interests to make sure that you don't lose something that's important to you? And how do you manage to continue to advance simultaneously? Or is it sort of a round robin so that you're able to maintain these things that are important to you and advance them all? Anya um, and Aisha, before either of you answer, I just would like to ask, and I know you just passed the mic back, but if you can just maybe speak louder and tell us who you are. 
My name is Stephanie Green. Um, I'm an attorney. I'm probably an artist somewhere, um, <laughs> which is something that I'm also working on, and I think something that drew me so passionately to pursue this calendar that I published, The Lays to Do's, um, staying up until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and then going into work, um, sometimes doing all-nighters because I got so caught up, and I can't believe that I missed your exhibit at Hyde Park Art Center and, and a couple of other events. It's yeah, like yeah. I just don't know because I'm not connected to my website in that way, but I'm connected to other things that I'm so passionate about, and I'm so happy <laughs> right now. But so, so that's me. I'm, I'm 53, and I found my place late, but I'm happy to be here, and I appreciate the journey that I've been on to get where I am now. Um, but I have a lot that I still want to do, and I want to make sure I push everything along. Thank you so Aisha. much. Thank you. Thank you. Aisha? OK. Um, I'm also a mom. I have a soon-to-be six-year-old. Um, I'm raising my 17 and 18-year-old sisters. Um, I'm a I'm faculty at Northeastern Illinois University, executive director of a nonprofit, artistic director of a dance company. Um, and I just don't know. I think I, I, I don't know. My parents kept me busy. So I went from karate <laughs> school to dance school to school school. So that was in me since I was 13, and I've just stayed on that journey. But I've recently come to a point of clarity where the thing, choreography is still very much who I am. I'm able to take that and own it. Um, philanthropic work is up in the pot. So I've kind of been able to create a gumbo that allows me to keep those fibers that I was born with alive. And I'm being more cautious, though, about how I move so that I'm not burnt out. Mm -hmm. So self-care is important. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to your upcoming uh, self-care for artists piece. Um, and just, I'm still figuring it out. I'm taking on a new role next week um, that will position me in a different way. But it's all very much rooted in my mission, and that is to empower inner city young people to show them the portal that was shown to me so mm -hmm. that Wakanda keeps on going, that vibranium is here, <laughs> you know, that, that we were born with it. So that mission allows me to keep that pot stirring um, and also Sankofa, right, and teaching at Northeastern. I mean, I, when I was an undergrad, we didn't, I was a dance major. We didn't, I mean, we didn't learn about black dance. It was maybe a day, but I had two dance history courses. Mm. So I said, okay, I'm teaching at Northeastern. Black yeah. dance is the right. name of this course. Why not? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Why not? Going to Columbia, mm, thesis is going to study how African dance enhances the self-esteem of African-American girls ages 10 to 17 in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So again, throwing that in the pot, being mindful of the pot, and just a lot of prayer, a lot of self-care. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'm glad you, thank you for asking that question because, um, Tracy, you said something at some point today about how, you know, none of us are just one person. We're all networked. And, um, and so I think that that's really the answer. Like, I am not an individual. Um, I threw away the idea of the, you know, being a, a, a mm -hmm. solo genius artist a long time ago. Um, I have had students living in my house with me, helping me take care of my kids mm -hmm. since I started working at a university environment. So I'm providing housing for a young artist <laughs> that's growing, providing mentorship. You know, I'm in, I'm in, I'm on her back every mm -hmm. day still. She's like, hey, Onye. But you know, like <laughs> at the kitchen table, like, what do you mean? You can't just be a choreographer. You have to be an administrator too, right? And, but, and at the same time through like, mentoring her to mentor my son to get his homework done, right? There's a, there's a way that she's making it possible for me to be here tonight because that kite assignment is due tomorrow. And <laughs> here I am. And you see what I'm saying? So, so that is definitely a part of it, Network, realizing that I can't do it all. Um, having a young woman that lives in another state that's writing, that's doing you know, grant work for me, um, you know, realizing that the check that I get from my position in the system is meant right. to be networked out because right. there's value that's coming back. Absolutely. And so it's not just my individual paycheck, that it's a paycheck that's coming into a, a vision of, of, uh, that, that's multiple, that's we, 
and so and 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 being open to the to the bounty that that network will provide. So both Aisha and I, you know, we knew of each other, but last year we spent a year sharing a beautiful composer, um, Damon Locks, who would come from oh, rehearsal to my fantastic. rehearsal and bring stories and images and pictures, and and so we were connected before we even got a chance to share space with one another. And so all of those things, I think, are rejuvenating and. And, and thinking of them and feeling them as rejuvenating and energizing sometimes helps so that when you look at your Outlook calendar on your phone, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm exhausted. <laughs> you know, but you flip that script and see, but I got a chance to be with Damon here, and I got a chance to be with you today, and I got a chance to hear all these beautiful voices, and so there's energy coming towards me, and I can choose to connect to what's feeding me. And at the same time, I have to recognize as you know, time moves on, that um, you know, there's that Taoist principle of learning to do by not doing, mm -hmm. learning to breathe into that community, and um, as I get older, start to to feed it energetically and recognize that you know there are layers and um, things change as you get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I think rather than an ending question, I'm going to end with gratitude. I want to thank you all for the energy that you sent up here in listening and respecting what was said because it, it was palpable, right? Mm. Can you feel it? Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to thank you for your genius, for each of you, the genius that you each represent. <laughs> Lastly, I want to thank Cape. I want to thank Kate for being a body that brings us together, um, that creates this type of space, and that reminds us that each of us has to contribute to the next generation and the next generation of Cape, of African American philanthropists and allies to African American philanthropy because we need it. We absolutely need it. And so I'm going to just ask you all, especially since you have um, passed the baton and the talking stick so beautifully, and only us can make it something real. And, you know. I'm watching it saying, oh, I, you know, I'm glad it didn't drop. Because it, felt, <laughs> because it felt like I could see it. I could see it and you pass it so carefully. And I also want to thank um, and recognize our two champions also yes. for what you recognize. <laughs> so let's close by clapping for our champions and clapping. For our institution. And for each other. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all so much. One more hand for our panelists and for our moderator. Um, my name is Karenina Grimble, and I promise I won't keep you very long. I'm a co-chair for CAPE, um, and we want to present our panelists just with um, tokens of our appreciation. Um, you guys are awesome and amazing, and the energy that you have brought into this room with you that you are giving to us is priceless, and we really are so thankful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, oh, thank you so much. Um, you, the audience, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank our sponsors again. Um, thank you for all your support of the awardees, um, for coming to support the panelists, for coming to support CAPE. We need you. Um, we really do. And we are so thankful to have you um, be the shoulders that we, that we stand on. Um, and we hope, as we heard today, that we will take those lessons and lift as we climb. Um, that was just a theme that we continue to hear from these panelists. And let's live into that. Um, so thank you for that as well. Um, and just two more things. I want to let you guys know we are having a membership meeting in July. Um, please join us, July 25th. Um, thank you to Graham Grady. I don't know if he's still here. And the generous support of the Fry Foundation. It will be at the Cliff Dwellers um, Club. There will be more information coming um, out uh, via email. So if we don't have your email address and you want to come to that meeting, please make sure that you leave it with us. Um, and then lastly, I, I just want to thank you so much, Tawa. You have put in so much work. Um, <laughs> this has been an amazing evening. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us. We really, really, really appreciate your presence here with us. And don't let the conversations end. There are drinks. There's food. Um, so continue your conversations over there. 
but also continue your conversations as we move forward and, and, and build together. Um, we can't stop this tonight, right? We can't stop this tonight. And the one thing I got reminded, if you were on the planning committee, please stay here for a photo. <laughs> Let's do it right this time. Stay here for a photo. And the panelists, how are y'all? But everyone else, please go enjoy. Thank you so much. <laughs>